Welcome my friends, this is Maniacal Incorporated, and you join me in the nice library of Sirip Vaults. It's not a great library, it's not a grand library, but it's nice. And everything in the nice library is nice. The tables are nice, the chairs are nice, we have some nice bookcases, and even the books and scrolls themselves are nice. Every once in a while, a piece of schist makes its way in here, but in general, we only have nice books. And on the left is the private library, and here is the public library. Now, why do I have it divided like that? Well, that is to mitigate the chance of book theft, and yes, that is a lever in the private library connected to nothing. What could that be about? Well, I'm going to explain that. But I'm going to start with how to make paper and how to make books and writing material themselves to start with. There are three and a half different types of sheets that you can make in Dwarf Fortress, and we'll start with papyrus. Here outside the front of the fort, this is where I would grow my papyrus if I had any. Papyrus has no role in cooking, and it doesn't produce seeds, so you can't trade for it, you can't take it on your embarkation setup. Uh, you're not going to be able to trade for it, and if you have papyrus, you're not going to be able to grow more of it. So the only way to actually get it is if it is growing on your embarkation location, and it only grows in tropical woodlands. When papyrus is cut down in the same way that you would use the gathering order, so if you were to gather an area, uh, your papyrus could be taken to a farmer's workshop where there is an order or a task to make sheet from plant. And this will only work for papyrus. The next type of sheet is paper. And to make paper, we need one of the cloth plants. So something like pigtails or a rope reed. And to make this into paper, First thing you're going to need from a stoneworker's workshop is a millstone. And the millstone can then be used to either make a powered millstone, if you want to connect it up to something like a windmill, or you can go with the manual version in farming and quern. So here is a quern in place. And... I can add a task for somebody with the papermaking skill to mash plant into slurry. And what that's going to do is somebody is going to come along with the papermaking skill and take some cloth plant here, some pigtails, and mash it into a glob of slurry. That can be stored freely in a stockpile, but there is a chance that it can be cleaned up and destroyed, so it's best to have some barrels empty. And once we have some globs of slurry, these can be taken to a screw press. The screw press is made from some mechanisms, and a task can be given. I usually have this for pressing honey from honeycomb, but we can also use it to press plant slurry into paper sheet. So that's a fairly straightforward enough process, but here in Syrup Falls, we like to do the most difficult and convoluted of operations. So we're going to make parchment instead, and it's predominantly parchment that I make here in Sirip Bolts. The first building that we need is a kiln. And the kiln is making plaster powder from gypsum, which I import, but it also has another work order to make quicklime. And what happens here is that somebody with the furnace operator skill will take a rock that is Calcium carbonate, so that is calcite, chalk, which we have plenty of here in Sirip Vaults, all these rough-hewn chalk walls, the whole thing is basically chalk. Uh, it could also be limestone or marble, so those are the four calcium carbonate rocks, and it's going to take one of them to here and burn it. Now, of those four rocks, if you add dolomite, you then have the five flux stones that are required for making steel. So quite often here, I'm able to get both of those processes done with chalk. Uh, you're going to need bags, empty bags, to hold the quicklime. 
and that is then taken to a an ashery where somebody with the lie making skill and an empty bucket is going to convert the quick lime into milk of lie so we have here make lie and we should have barrels of it somewhere i'm actually not entirely too sure where it gets stored it gets stored in the barrels and bags stockpile so it can actually be quite difficult to kind of control where it ends up as you can see this place is actually just full of soap so once we have our milk of lime and there's actually some here in a barrel in the stockpile around the kiln once we have our milk of lime the next thing we need to do is butcher an animal so I'm going to come to the pets and livestock, and we do have a tremendous amount of llamas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a llama. I'm going to find a stray llama and butcher it. And here is our llama being led to the slaughter so that we may write things on its skin. However, before we slaughter the llama, there is one thing that we want to do. If we check under the standing orders menu, the first time that you enter this menu, it will say automate tannery. So what's going to happen is that as soon as the llama is slaughtered, its hide will be taken to a tannery and tanned into leather. That's not what we want. And the reason for that is because if the raw hide is left in a stockpile for long enough, it will rot and cause miasma. So the tannery is automated by default to pick that hide up straight away and tan it. So what we want to do is actually turn that off. Do not automate tannery. And I don't think this is the tannery that I use. It actually is. But here I have a task to make parchment in the tanner's shop. Even if you put on this make parchment job and you haven't turned off automated tannery, they're still going to pick up the hide and turn it into leather. That automate tannery task is going to take precedence over this one. So we take a look at our llama, and the llama is gone, and has now become, there's a lot of bones there, has become so many nice things, including stray llama skin. So for now it's been dumped into a stockpile, but eventually somebody is going to come along, they're going to take that stray llama skin, they're going to take some milk of lime, and somebody with the tanner's skill is going to take that to a tanner's rack and make it into parchment. At the start I said there were three and a half different types of sheet that you could make. So I've covered parchment, I've covered paper, and I have covered papyrus. What is the half? When making parchment, if I was to slaughter a cat and make parchment, we would have cat parchment. An alpaca would give us alpaca parchment. A llama would give us llama parchment. And a cow would give us vellum. So it's a different name. It's the only animal, when slaughtered and when used for parchment, that will give a different name. And historically... In medieval Ireland, there was a massive industry committed to making vellum for the written materials. The Book of Kells and things like this are written on vellum. So I tend to try and focus on vellum here, and I'm pretty much getting rid of my alpaca population at the moment, so that one day I just have this massive herd of cows for making vellum. Now that we have some sheets, it's time to turn them into something that can be written on. Here at this Crafts Dwarfs workshop, we can add some tasks. On the top menu, just by pressing or typing in Q, we have Make Choir. So somebody with the bookbinding skill will take a sheet and make it into a choir. And a choir is basically an unbound book. So this choir will then be put into a chest in one of the libraries where somebody will write on it. And that can then actually be put into the bookshelves now can be further improved by binding it, but that is step one in a an optional two-step process of making a book. The next task that we're going to look at is, I'll go to rock, it doesn't really make a difference, but 
I have this workshop set up to only take from the stockpile of nice rocks. And on the rock we have two different options. One is to make rock scroll rollers. And the other is to make rock book binding. So when those items are created, the choir will be taken directly to the library to be written on. And the scroll rollers and the book bindings, they can be stored in a finished goods stockpile. And I have set this one up here to only take tools that are nice. Only to take nice tools. So here in this finished goods bin, I have some nice book bindings and some nice scroll rollers. At this stage, and I haven't really been able to get this working, the scroll rollers can be improved. They can be decorated. The book bindings can't, choirs can't, bound books can't, and actual scrolls can't. So the only thing that can be improved are these scroll rollers, but I haven't had a tremendous amount of success with that just yet. Now you also don't need to make both book bindings and scroll rollers. You could just have a library of scrolls, you could just have a library of books, which isn't the actual term, or you could have just a library of choirs. Scrolls tend to be shorter form content, and choirs tend to be longer form content, so I kind of create a mix of them. But once we have some scroll rollers and some book bindings, I've actually, I'm using a separate Crafts Dwarfs workshop for this task, and the tasks that we are looking for here, bind book, and I think it's on the top level as well, make scroll. So make scroll is going to take a sheet, it's going to take a scroll roller, and again somebody with the book binding skill is then going to make a scroll which will be taken to a library and put in a chest for somebody to write on. With the bind book task, that will take a choir that has been written upon. It will take reindeer hair thread or any type of thread and the book binding. So you also need thread for this process, which you can make at a loom from, in this case, animal hair or from uh, wool or cloth or cobwebs. And again, somebody with the book binding skill is going to bind a book from a choir that has been written upon. It has to be written upon first of all. Now upstairs in the private library we can see some of the items that I've just been talking about. In this coffer that's placed in the library we have some vellum choirs. So this has not been written upon. And we also have some vellum scrolls and again they have not been written upon. And then on the bookshelves we can see for example Against Perception. This is a well-crafted vellum choir. It has not been bound. Written on the item is a manual entitled Against Perception, and it gives us the author and a value, and it tells us that the prose is amateurish at best. And if I look around, here we can see a nice bound codex. So when you bind a choir, what you get is a codex. And this tells us that this is a nice bound codex. The written portion consists of a 134 page guide entitled New Torrid Gates. So the, the name kind of gets hidden. All you're told is nice bound codex. You're not actually told the, the title anymore as you are with the choirs. And you can tell it's a choir because of the image. And then here we have scrolls, so summaries abridged. Somebody has decided to name a shield. And this is a superior quality water buffalo parchment scroll. The rollers are made from galena, the rollers are made from well-crafted nice. I'm not too sure why it's coming up with two separate types of stone. I don't believe I have any galena in this fort. And then written on the item is a manual entitled Summaries Abridged. So these get stored in the bookcases once they have actually been written upon. So choirs and scrolls and codexes which have been bound, they get placed in the bookcases. 
So a very brief overview for creating a library. We will come to Place Zones, and we will put down a meeting area, and accept, and then click on the plus to assign a new or existing location, and we can create a new library. The Treasury of Mirrors, and from there then, we're able to set the details for the assigned location. So there are two positions that we can add. Scholar and Scribe. The Scholar is going to spend their time thinking, researching, which is a mechanic that is in the game but isn't fully expanded upon at the moment, so I might deal with that in a later video. But they will spend their time thinking on various different topics and using the written material that's in the chess to create written content. And the scribe is going to copy that content. So you can determine how many copies of each item that's created you want to keep. So when a scholar writes a book or when a new book is brought into the fort, maybe if you purchase one, the scribes will then maintain a certain amount of copies and you can decide how many copies you want to maintain. Uh, here we have chess in common area, so you're going to need to put chess in the library so that they can be uh, used to store writing material. And then of course, very important, we can decide who is and who isn't allowed into the library. So looking here at the private library, the Diamond Mansion, we're told that it has 12 bookcases, 7 tables and 7 chairs. For a dwarf to be able to write, they need a chair and a table and something to write on. And for a dwarf to be able to read, they will need a chair and a table and something to read. The private library is open only to citizens and long-term residents. I think I might actually move that towards citizens. And the total number of each copy that I want is just one. Uh, we have one chest in the area. There's a desired number of written materials that can be changed or decreased. And here I have three scholars. Uh, two of them pretty much only appear every once in a while because they are in the militia. But Unib is our dedicated scholar and Olin is our dedicated scribe. Now, as I mentioned, we have a public library and a private library. So here is the private library with bookcases, and here is the public library with no bookcases, and the Duchess of Learn Letters has entered here. They are a visitor to our fort, so they are blocked off from entering the private library. They can only enter the public library. And the reason for this is to mitigate book theft. Book theft isn't really a thing in the game, the way that books are treated is that the whole world is a library. So visitors to your fort will pick up a book and they will think, this is fantastic, it needs to be copied, and they will take it back to their fort to copy it. You don't get a pop-up that the book has been stolen in the same way that you would with an artifact or with any other piece of material. And off they go. And you will probably never see that book again unless a copy of it comes back to your library or back to your fort to be sold in a trade caravan. It can happen that very quickly visitors to your fort will empty your library, no matter how many copies you're keeping. And if you fall behind with written material for a short space of time, they can absolutely empty your library. So there are a couple of solutions to this. One is to just prevent visitors from your fort or from any of your libraries. However, visiting scholars can actually use material in your fort to write books themselves. And a lot of the books that I have were actually written by visiting scholars. So I do like to, to allow scholars to visit. Another option is to just keep making copies, keep making copies, keep making copies, and not really care. The option that I have implemented, however, is the public and private libraries. If a scholar enters the public library, first of all, there are no books that they can read and take. So the only thing that they can do in here is write. They can think on topics, they can discuss with the people 
that they meet in here and they can write. They can't do anything else. And they have written material in the nice coffer. So they have some vellum scrolls and a choir. Now, if they write on something, they're going to be at a table, they're going to write, they're going to leave the item on the table, and somebody is then going to get a job to store that. So they will enter, they will pick up the item, and they will store it in the private library. Haha, -ha, job done. Fantastic. Absolute fail-safe. There is nothing that could possibly go wrong there is something that could go wrong. And this did go wrong in one of my streams where I had a Thundra Titan skin parchment. And it was made into either a scroll or a choir, I'm not too sure. And a scholar visited the fort, they wrote something on it, and immediately picked it up and left the fort with it. Much to my shock and horror and devastation. I actually think I built a statue to them, a kind of a wanted poster, just in case they ever came back. So the option, the next thing that we can do to prevent that from happening, is to remove the tables from the library. If a scholar visits this library, they will sit at a table, they will utilize the table, they'll sit in the chair and utilize the table to write something, but when they place it on the table, because it is outside the library, they cannot pick it up. And the only people that can pick it up are members of the fort who will come in and who will take it to the private library, where it will be stored for the enjoyment of my dwarves and my dwarves only. And since I removed the tables, I have had no problems with written material going missing. The only massive drawback from the system of having two separate libraries, and they are two separate buildings, the Diamond Mansion and the Mansion of Planks, the only setback is that your dwarves and visitors to the fort won't be able to discuss and share ideas. But it keeps the book safe, and that's the most important thing. Now, finally, why is there a lever in the corner of the library? In short, I don't know. I don't know what it's doing there. It's not connected to anything. And there is a pull the lever task on high priority assigned to Unib, our scholar. And here is Unib. They are currently pondering bandages. And they feel content pondering bandages, which is another reason why you could create a library is to assign it to some people to give them positive thoughts. The research mechanic, like I said, isn't fully fleshed out in the game as yet, but things can actually be discovered, and dwarves can discover things. But the idea behind this, it's something that I saw on the Dwarf Fortress wiki, it was discovered many moons ago in the pre-Steam release, and it is known as Orst's Lever. And the idea is that a scholar would be assigned to pull this lever, and that they would do so if they aren't writing anything, and that this would kind of knock them into a state where they would go and they would write a book. It's not something that I've had tremendous success with. A previous scholar just kept going back and forth from the door to the lever to the door to the lever, oscillating back and forth between the pull lever task and the put something in stockpile task. So it's not something that I've had a tremendous amount of success with, but if you check the Dwarf Fortress wiki, I'll post a link below in the description to understanding the wonder, the magic, the mystery of Orst's Lever. So it could be used if you want to generate more written content in your library if you're finding that your scholars aren't actually writing. It might be a way of getting them to do so. So there we go. Everything that you ever wanted to know about papermaking, bookbinding, setting up a library, possibly more than you ever wanted to know. If you think there's anything I left out or anything that wasn't clear, please do leave it in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please do leave a like. And if you would like to know why there is a naked goblin zombie in a cage on a pedestal in the public library, if you would like to know why there is an empty pedestal, in the private library, 
check out the description below for a link to my Twitch channel where I stream Dwarf Fortress every once in a while. And I also have some other videos which uh, cover some of the other topics and some of the reasons as to why those pedestals are stocked in the way they are. Thank you very much for joining me on this episode, and I hope that you too will go and set up a nice library. <laughs>